Thank you for that reminder. Um, awesome. So now I'm going to uh, have the honor of introducing Jared Hang. Jared is a university honors student. And this documentary that he has been putting uh, his work into, his time and his energy to make sure that his father and his father's family's story is told is part of his um, university honors senior thesis project. Uh, and Jared, I have had the, op the opportunity to uh, view and preview your film and uh, the audience is in, in for a treat. And uh, thank you so much for uh, being willing to share your work and share your, your family's story. Um, it is truly inspirational. And um, I will now turn it over to you. The show is yours. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, it is, this has been a project uh, several years in the making. I guess if you want to go back uh, at least 40 years in the making, um, my, my dad's young. I, I don't know his age. Huh. Um, anyways, uh, it is a pleasure to have you all here. Thank you so much for coming. I will be uh, playing this version of the documentary that I have currently edited. This is still a work in progress, but what I have here uh, it details the stories uh, from the perspectives. And I interviewed my uncle and uh, two of my aunts, as well as my grandma and my father. And you'll be hearing uh, their perspectives on uh, what they remember uh, from how they escaped the Cambodian genocide some, how long has it been? Like 50 years ago, 45 years ago, um, 46. So this, the Cambodian genocide started in 1975. There's a lot of stuff that was happening around then, but I will leave it to the video to detail uh, the rest of the background information that I have provided. Um, without further ado, let's get started. Give me a sec while I pull up my uh, screen or my share screen. There we go. Sorry, I have monitors over on this side that I will be using. Okie dokie. Can, ever, uh, give me a thumbs up or some sort of reaction or something if you can see my mildly derpy face over here. Awesome. You know, the lovely thing about pausing videos uh, before they uh, continue is that you get these wonderful faces like this. All right, give me a sec to set up for the people we have on Twitch. Alrighty, it is now in full screen. Now, uh, I will also provide the link in chat if need be for those of you who show up late or for those of you who want to just mute this chat and watch the video in say 1.25 speed. Attention spans vary from people to people. That is completely understandable. Um, I myself could not watch uh, my own documentary for the 46th time, which is 30 minutes long plus more on one time speed when I was editing it. So I completely understand. All right, um, let's do a sound check real quick. Can you guys Hi, this? Hi, my name is Jared Hang. I'm an American. All right, let's start it from the beginning. I will mute my mic and here we go. Hi, my name is Jared Hang. I'm an American born to Southeast Asian immigrants. When I was a child, my parents often told me of the hardships they had to endure as immigrant children displaced by war. My father and his family escaped the Cambodian genocide, which was carried out by the communist Khmer Rouge regime between the years of 1975 to 1979 and killed up to 3 million people. My mother and her family were one of the Vietnamese boat people, Vietnamese refugees who escaped the country by boat after the Vietnam War. My parents told me the stories of the lives they lived before and after these traumatic events. So naturally, I wanted to learn more. 
In the documentary that follows, I will be retelling the story of how my father and his family escaped the Cambodian genocide and immigrated to the United States. As an American learning history throughout the public, private, and charter school systems, we never seem to cover the events that brought my parents to the United States and myself into existence. When I turned to the Cold War section of my history textbooks, if they even had them, the most I'd get was a page or so on the Vietnam War. If I was lucky, the word Cambodia would show up once in a single sentence. It felt as if the history of an extant nation of people beset by death and destruction wasn't important enough for a single page of history. If I were to hazard a guess, you're probably wondering where Cambodia is. This is Cambodia, also known as Kampuchea, in what was once Indochina, the countries of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. China is to the north, with the Pacific Ocean to the east. As it turns out, there is an incredible amount of complicated history in Indochina. As such, what follows is a shortened history of the Cambodian genocide, with the additional context of Vietnam, the United States, and the roles they played in setting the stage. The Cambodian genocide is an oft-forgotten atrocity that claimed the lives of between 1.5 to 3 million people, which was a quarter of Cambodia's population at the onset of the genocide. It officially started in 1975, at the end of the Vietnam War. The Khmer Rouge, French for Red Khmer, comprised mainly of ethnic Khmer, who made up 85% of Cambodia's population at the onset of the genocide. The Khmer Rouge was led by Pol Pot, a ruthless French-educated Cambodian communist revolutionary and politician who governed the country as its prime minister between the years of 1975 and 1979. They targeted members of all other national, ethnic, racial, and religious groups of people. Though they tended not to target ethnic Khmer or native Cambodian speakers, the Khmer Rouge also targeted other Khmer peoples if they belonged to the previous government or were otherwise deemed enemies of the state. People who wore glasses or spoke multiple languages were executed for fear that they would rebel against the regime. They also targeted professionals, intellectuals, the Buddhist monkhood, and ethnic minorities. The Khmer Rouge banned the existence of more than 20 ethnic groups, which comprised of an estimated 15% of Cambodia's population. By the end of the estimated 3 million deaths, 1.4 million of those deaths were the result of direct violence or executions. The rest was the result of famine, disease, or other indirect causes. In 1968, before their rise to power, the Khmer Rouge started the Cambodian Civil War by launching an insurgency against King Norodom Sihanouk. Communist North Vietnam, in some capacity, provided shelter and weaponry to the insurgents. In 1970, with his failure to effectively put down the insurgency, King Sihanouk was deposed and exiled by his own government, leading to the creation of the short-lived pro-US Cambodian Republic under Lan Nol. Under Henry Kissinger, the United States led a series of bombing campaigns targeting the neutral border region of Cambodia. Between the years of 1970 and 1973, they targeted North Vietnamese supply lines and guerrilla strongholds. This bombing campaign destabilized the already unstable country. After years of devastating civil war, the Khmer Rouge marched triumphantly through the capital of Phnom Penh in 1975. After renaming the country to Democratic Kampuchea, they formed a new regime under Pol Pot. They then systematically emptied out city after city, using the looming threat of American bombings as justification. North Vietnamese and Cambodian relations were historically strained, though for a short while, the communist governments of both countries maintained outwardly positive relations. After the United States pulled its forces out of Vietnam in 1975, any semblance of cooperation between the two communist states quickly eroded. Following a few years of border conflicts, a massacre that resulted in the deaths of 3,000 Vietnamese civilians, and growing distrust between the Soviets and the Chinese, who supported Vietnam and Cambodia respectively, Vietnam launched a full-scale invasion of Cambodia in 1979. During the invasion, the Vietnamese found region after region plagued by famine, disease, infighting, destruction, and death. Among other evidence of the Khmer Rouge's atrocities is the prison of torture called Tol Slung, also known as S-21. It was a converted schoolyard that became the final resting place of an estimated 20,000 prisoners. Of these, 23 survived when the prison was liberated. 
also found throughout the entirety of Cambodia were thousands of mass graves, which would later be called the Killing Fields, after which a movie would be named. My father and his family, who are ethnically southern Chinese, were at a great risk of being executed. My aunts recall my grandmother telling them to not speak Chinese and only speak Cambodian. My grandparents knew their time was limited. Luckily, they escaped the country in 1975 at the onset of the genocide. In July of 2018, I interviewed my uncle Keith, my aunt Linda, and my aunt Jenny, as well as my grandmother. In February of 2021, I interviewed my father, Steve Hang. What follows is their stories of their harrowing escape from the Cambodian genocide. My name is Keith Hang. Jenny Gagliano. My name is Linda Hang. Uh, Sam Hang. They announced to everybody said that the war is over. So don't be panicked. Everybody's safe now. After seven days, they came out and said, it's no longer safe in this city. This city will be bombed by American B-52 soon. We had to walk 20 or 30 miles in order to get to the jungle. We don't know where we're going and they don't tell us where we're going. An old man and a little girl was walking behind me. She kept saying, my dad is old, my dad is old, can I slow down? They said, no, you keep going. So your dad is too old. And then they killed him. I got scared when I see that I hear the gunshot. I told mom and mom like, let's go, keep going, keep walking. A week just passed by, I was still in the jungle. They say, well, there's no way you're going back now. So build your own house, go find the wood. And, and they provide us very little, little food. And we had to go out there to the field to find crabs, frogs, snake, drangula, whatever you find, and eat it. There's uh, actually six of us. They got three, three boys and three girls. One at the old nine month. And then my brother was, uh, then he catch a pneumonia, mm, baby son. He was only like four months, five months old. And even though I have medicine, I couldn't help him out. And he didn't even move, his eyes just like that. We just gathered around and he wouldn't close his eyes until he saw every one of us. And then he passed away. Mm. That's what made us think twice that we better leave or we gonna die just like him. My little brother came to my dad's dream and tell my dad that he have to leave the country, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had to put him, roll him into a blanket because there's no coffin and we have to do it secretly so the Khmerers don't see it. Because if they see it, they're just gonna tell us to throw his body away. So we bury him first and then we escape. Dad gathered his na uh, neighbor and said, who wanna go with me? If I stay here, all my kids will die of starvation or of sickness. Before we escape, we, we need some food. I'm sorry to say this, I kill one dog, big dog, like German Shepherd or something. And it's not easy, but we have no choice. We all dress in black. Midnight, zoom, everybody meet up and we all start walking. And how many of you were there? Well, about 30 people, about 30. Yeah, including kids. As far as the escape, I was only four and I was always on my dad's back. At that first day, we got food, and we thought it's only take one day to get to Thailand. The second day, we're down to very little food and no waters. I remember we had to drink dew water from leaves. I, one drop, I sip from every tree, every leaf that I can find to quench my thirst. And then we start eating leaf, grass, anything that we found. One day, we're walking around and around and around the same spot. We don't know where we're going. And then we hear noise. We didn't know who it was. And then my dad saw the three guys. They're dressed in black. All the army dress black. And they have an axe as their weapons. And they have one shotgun. And the other guy have a, like a shovel. We try to be quiet, but suddenly two of my cousins, the twin, she's crying. The three soldiers, because I heard what they said, they say, must be a ghost. 
So when they try to run, they run into the bush that we're hiding in. Normally, when they caught you, they will shoot you at a spot. Luckily, the guy, he wasn't ready. And then he thought there's only five of them in the front because it's, he only see five. But actually, we're all lined up behind him. He said, okay, it's okay, you lost. Let me take you back to the village. When he said, let's go, so we all just walk, rise up from the field. When we rise up, there's like 30 of us in there. And he got shocked. He was like, whoa. <laughs> when they offered to take us to the village, at the time, we had no choice. We just keep walking and follow them. I don't believe in miracle. That day was so shiny, so bright. And suddenly, the storming right away. So when it rained, they lost. They said, oh my God. We have to turn back. And my dad said, why, what happened? He said, we almost reached Thailand. If you go any further, it will be Thailand. And now my dad said, oh, did he just say border? And then we were so happy because we are looking for the border of Thailand for a week now. And then they tell us to wait, to wait, wait here for them. Don't go. Yeah. So we they wait go for get help. help. Yeah. They go get help. Then we decide we run. Run. So we have to find our way like swimming in the field. It's so tall, you can see each other. And plus now it's raining and also it's dark. Around 7.30, they brought a truckload of army. I can hear gunshots so close behind my back. And like mom said, keep going. If you don't go, you're gonna get shot. Keep running, keep running. They can't see, too dark. So all they do, they're shooting. They just shoot it in the grass, in the field. Like boom, 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 boom. And after that, we get in deeper and deeper, we hear just like further. They say, oh, I think we're safe now. Now we can take a rest now. So when we rest, we all just drop dead. After we woke up, we're so thirsty again. So we have no choice. You have to bring, drink, drink your own pee. Instead of drinking everybody else's pee, you know, you have to drink, you can drink, pee yourself and drink your own. I was like, ew, that's gross. And I remember what it tastes like too. The pee that you haven't peed for a long time is kind of yellow and it's nasty. My mom told me to pee and I said, why I have to pee? She said, just say pee. So then she gave me the drink. So I took a drink. I go, oh yeah. I go, yeah, what is that? And then mom said, it's your pee. Did yeah. you drink the pee too? My mom put yeah. the smell, man. Yeah. What it tastes like? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a smell. <laughs> we found two boys and a father. They say, Sir, sir, please help us. What city is this? He said, no, this is Thai. I said, Thai? Really? So he said, okay, okay, don't worry. We went to the temple and they come and rescue us. And they brought us to a refugee camp. So I just start with the fact that I was born in Cambodia. Based okay. on the official records, it was August 18th, 1965. So when I was born, uh, my mom was not able to take care of me and the two siblings. Uh, grandma, my grandmother, grandfather, had decided to come and take me and raise me. So they had taken me from, I believe, the main town that our family had residence in was uh, a town called um, Stung Treng. And we, uh, they had, um, Grandma Grandma took me to live in a village uh, not far from there. Uh, but my understanding is that I grew up in a small village with lots of um, uh, cousins. We had no school. We Daily we would just go out and have fun uh, howling at mango trees, climbing mango trees, and my, my mom's um, baby sister, uh, she really the one that took care of me, and there were stories that were told that when the bombings were going on, I would be the first that she grabs and would uh, bring me to the back uh, bunker. Not until uh, things start to, uh, countries start to fall apart that everyone started to reunite. Grandma and Grandpa decided to join up with my uh, parents and my family, and that's when I got to know my siblings, um, older brother, 
uh, oldest brother Keith and older sister Linda and younger sister um, uh, Jenny. We sort of uh, re reunite to determine where we're going to go next and not knowing what direction the Khmer Rouge was, was going, uh, somehow uh, my parents decided to go um, to the countryside and we established a new residence there uh, for a while, uh, exactly how many months or how many years, I don't know. Mom and Dad had set up a general store and um, Uncle Keith was helping with running the general store and Grandpa was there. While we in this town, um, that's when Grandpa started to hire tutors. Interestingly, we, he wanted us to learn more Chinese, um, not knowing what's going to happen in the future. I grew up speaking mostly uh, Chao Chao. Uh, because Grandpa only spoke Chao Chao, and uh, I had to learn how to speak Cambodian. Uh, I just remember that uh, one day when we went to our little tutor place, the um, the teacher was not uh, there anymore, and that's when we start to realize something's going on, and it's now reached our little town. I just remember one day that um, uh, there's a bullhorn came out and just said, "Get out of your house." and come and follow us. And so we packed whatever we could. Uh, we didn't know we were coming back home or not. And um, so we just packed whatever we could and just follow along. Now the, the tough part was I was also sick at this time. So I was ill, I don't know if I was in a flu, a cold, whatever illness I had. Next thing I remember was we were uh, lined up in on each side of the road with the soldiers in the middle and we would just go on a long march. Uh, I didn't witness any type of um, uh, you know, punishment or anything that was going on, but I know my sister did. She witnessed uh, some soldiers um, killing people and, and so on, but I did not. I remember uh, grandpa, my grandpa, uh, was uh, pretty much either carrying me or uh, had me uh, um, uh, lean on him and, and hold me all the time as we march. Uh, once we, the um, soldiers decided that they're, they're done marching us, they found a location and it's in the middle of nowhere, they said, this is your new home. Go and build yourself a shelter for each family. Every day uh, we wake up and we line up for uh, our daily uh, food um, offerings that they give us. And typically it's a bowl of rice with maybe a few pieces of um, dried meat or dried fish and uh, the rest of the time we forage the land and we look for snakes, we look for frogs, we look for crickets, we look for uh, grasshoppers and anything to provide protein in addition to the little food that they provide for us. Every evening they typically have some type of uh, propaganda rally and to give the whole speech of you know, we, we're, we have a new Kampuchea and we are now united as a utopian society and we will help another, one another to rebuild and that was one way for them to decide, okay, if you wear glasses and you're a teacher or you're a professor or your history of doing that, uh, it's their way of taking you away and execute you so that they, don't, they, they will make sure that those who stick around will obey their rules and their laws and their and their demands. Even though I was born in Cambodia, my skin tone and my features is more Chinese. Right. So yes, a lot of the they, they give you different looks, but if you're cooperating and you're not rebelling and you're not resisting, they tend to overlook those things. Since our family really not having any educational skills, uh, we were lucky that not, no one was uh, in, that, in that boat of uh, taken away to be executed. Do you remember like roughly the ratio of like soldiers to people? I, if I were venture to guess, it's probably 100 to 1. Hmm. And so it's not like, um, but you know, when you have uh, the guns, they have the guns and you got nothing, um, no one resisted or if they right. did, we didn't hear about it because uh, you're so busy locking your own little world, doing your own little thing, that you tune out what's around you. Didn't really focus on what was going on other than trying to 
to live and survive. And a baby brother, he was uh, very young. He was just probably, I want to say he was less than a year old, maybe less than six months he was. Uh, but he was really sick, and, um, and we, uh, we were separated into different groups to do different odd jobs. From the stories I've heard from my cousin who was there longer, we were lucky, or I was lucky, that I didn't get to the point where they took me away to either become a soldier trained to be a soldier or to do other uh, work. So had we been there for another couple months, that would have happened to us. Uh, I guess once people fa- realize what's going on was when people start to, to figure that we either live here and do what they ask or we're going to die. Because when they came in, they came in saying that they're here to get rid of, of the, um, the Vietnamese uh, army that invaded Cambodia. I, I give all the credit to my dad to make the decision to find a way out of this, he call it hellhole. What triggered that decision was when my baby brother was so sick that he passed. And so when he died, I remember that evening when Keith, Linda, Jenny, and I was on our knees uh, next to his little um, blanket we we call him Ti, Ti Ti. In Chinese, Ti Ti is like little boy or little brother. When he took, after he took his, what we call, um, I guess his last breath. And so my dad would, when he buried him, he prayed to um, his baby son, pray that you go to heaven and reincarnate in a rich country and better environment. And but in the meantime, help daddy make a decision and also guide the rest of our family out of this place. So as he's planning, he's you know talking to the family uh, that wants to do it. I believe in total, uh, the numbers might be a little off, but the numbers, the number I remember is 27 of us. Uh, prior to the escape, I remember that um, my uncle had also bartered whatever we can for a, a dog. and. The dog was uh, our last meal, and that was our um, stew. I think we had a dog stew, I, I would recall, and that was to give us strength to be able to have the protein and the energy built up in our bodies to um, endure the, um, the journey. And we're trying to make it from where we were to Thailand. And so when we assembled at a rallying point under this tree, it was good weather, but it was pitch dark night. According to what my dad told me later, we were waiting there because he was waiting for a guide. He had hired a guide to take us to Thailand. The guide didn't show up. And so at this point, we either take a chance and go on our own, or we go back to the camps. The elders made a decision that, let's, let's give it a shot. But because there's, we had no sense of direction of where we were going, we just kept marching. and. Um, a trip that was supposed to take overnight turned into well, now we're lost somewhere in a jungle. The food was prepared for only that first night, so now the next several nights, several days, we're just foraging the land. We find um, you know frogs or we eat uh, leaves or plants that fortunately didn't poison us. The other thing that we got lucky is we never encountered any uh, any wild animal like tigers and lions that could have killed us. I like to believe that it's divine intervention. Perhaps it was my baby brother uh, that was watching over us. We went on and at this point, uh, second day, we're still walking in the jungle and um, we don't know where we are. Uh, we kept going. This part I remember being told by my, my dad, and what happened was he woke up on the third morning and he told grand, my, my mom that he had a, a dream. And in his dream was a, um, uh, a scene of us being captured by some, some soldiers, and there were three of them. And then another scene in his dream was that uh, he saw a little boy and the little boy took him by the hand 
to lead him away from this danger. The baby, the boy that took him by the hand was his baby son. The next day, the third day, was a day that we actually got captured. And that's when we were captured by, I believe, were three soldiers. They were just regular people like us that were taken into the Popot military. They happened to wander upon us, and um, the reason why they, they heard us was because they heard a baby cry. That was my baby cousin. Uh, who was on, on the trek, and when he, they heard a baby cry, they had all of us stand up and were shocked as the number of people that was with us. Most of the, I, I call it the, the weeds in Cambodia, are tall. I mean, you're literally almost like as tall as a tall cornfield, where you walk in, you're, you, no one sees you, and all you hear is rustling. And um, so the rustling of the, of the leaves and of the bamboo trees and so on is how they, they heard us and spotted us. They, they wanted to help f us find camp like they are and go with them. And uh, instead, um, they got lost. There was a point in time when the adult men considered taking these guys out and, and killing them, either them or us. But it was the adult women, uh, my mom and aunts and, and all that, said, we're not here to take lives and we're not going to hurt anybody. The adult men was able to convince them that, you know, we have a lot of people here, a lot of kids, we can't follow them if they're lost. And they said, okay, stay and wait here and we'll, we'll go find camp, we'll come back. So they took off. And after they took off, uh, a couple hours later, one of them forgot his bag or something and probably pretended to leave his bag and then came back and we were still waiting. And um, then uh, after they took off, um, we all decided to drop everything we got and just go light and go the opposite direction. But that third night, we could hear probably helicopters from the US military, whatever it was. We hear a helicopter, we hear noises, we hear you know gunshots going on. And, um, but we thought they were after us, but they really weren't. And most of the time when we were marching, they made the decision to march during the day because you have daylight, you see where you're going. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we try to rest at night. Day four, day five, we're still lost. Uh, and I, at this point, I remember we were start to dig holes to get, um, water and the water looks like coffee with condensed milk. It's brownish, and so you sip that just to have uh, some fluid in you. You drink dews that's on leaves in the morning. When there's dews, you lick that, and you eat leaves and all that just to survive. We also resort to drinking our own urine. Of course, you know, you're not uh, hydrated, so most of urine at that point are dark um, yellow, and um, you know, it's warm and, and um, nasty smelling. But at this point, we were just trying to stay uh, uh, nourished. Day five, day six, uh, the, we, we stumble upon a stump, a tree, an old tree stump that had hole and the water stayed in there. And I think because it's probably been fermenting, it's probably got lots of bacteria and germs and all that. But we all, again, had to drink whatever we could and one by one, everyone just got tired and fell asleep. And then before we all went down, the adults decided amongst themselves, someone needs to go try to find food, try to find camp, uh, turn ourselves in, because at this point we gave up. And instead, they came back with wagons and a couple monks from a nearby temple and it turned out that it was a Thai temple. They took us in and I remember them saying, don't rush and eat so much because you don't want to destroy your body that's been malnourished. But a few days later, we were taken to the refugee camp. And at the refugee camp, uh, we, that's where we, you, and you register. And you register with the family, register everybody. During the registration, this is when Grandpa uh, basically uh, made a statement that we're all newborn. And so we all shaved our heads 
and then he gave us a new name and he came up with the last name Heng, H-E-N-G because when you say Heng in Cambodian it means luck and we were lucky to be alive we were lucky to survive what we went through then he even gave us everyone a new birthday and signifying that we're now reborn And that is the rough cut of my documentary. Um, we'll now take uh, questions and uh, anything else. Thanks for coming, right. by the way. Awesome. I'd like every. I would like to invite everyone first to unmute themselves if they feel so so inclined and give a round of applause either um, virtually through your emojis or by uh, clapping your hands. So thank you, Jared, for your documentary. Woo! <laughs> Huzzah, Jared! Great job. Thanks for coming to watch, uh, people who are here. Um, as you can see, for those of you who watched the whole thing, it is a very rough cut. Uh, sound is a little bit unpolished. I apologize for all the jumps in audio and flips throughout, but uh, the main point here is the story, and uh, hopefully those little bits don't annoy you as much as they annoy me as the editor. <laughs> awesome. And Jared, we actually do have a couple of questions in the chat I yes. wanted to bring up. Um, I'm not sure if folks are still here that want to ask the question. Um, see, I think this person is not here anymore, actually. So let's see, from Caitlin, uh, since your family is ethnically Chinese, were you all traveling from Baden Bain? Oh, they already answered the question afterward. I, I like asked that like right in the beginning, but then afterward they said what uh, city or village you're from. Okay, awesome. Is there anything you'd like to add, Jerry, to that question? Um, my dad would know more about that. I do recall him saying something about Baden Bain and um, and the like. That's where they regrouped uh, as a family before they like went to the countrysides. Um, is pretty close to the Thai border. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. And then uh, we have another question. How do you recover from this, meaning your experience when you moved to the US? Um, so I don't, I would invite Mr. Hang to um, share your thoughts if you feel so inclined. Sure. Uh to answer that question, I think it's all about survival and watching that brings a lot of emotions. So I apologize for, for that. But um, we pretty much decided that when we got here, it's a new life and we wanna make the best of what we got. And we were very fortunate to have the sponsors, the, the church that gave us that new chance and meeting a lot of um, of people in church, as well as my dad working in a diner uh, when he first came to America and Tracy, he worked as a dishwasher at the diner. And so we were focused on just surviving and trying to figure out what we do now that we're here. And in the end, we're, we're, we're very fortunate that we are in America to have that opportunity to do what we, what we want to do. Great, thank you, Mr. Hang. Uh, Sydney, you have your hand up. Hi, Jared and Mr. Hang. Uh, sorry if I ramble a little bit, but I just thought, you know, that was a really powerful and impactful uh, movie. And um, I guess my question is based on my own experience. My dad and his family, uh, they're Khmer, and they escaped in, um, I think, 1981-ish, so a lot later. And I told him that I was gonna go see this documentary and asked if he wanted to come. And he said, oh, it's been 40 years. We should forget about it, move on. So what would you to say to those who believe that true healing can only come from forgetting about it and moving on? And what is the importance of continuing the conversation about what happened? So, yeah. Uh, so for me personally, uh, well, I guess, 
my stance is pretty clear by the fact that I'm presenting a documentary on the subject. I think it's very important to tell uh, histories and healing does come from discussing, but for some people and psychologically it's understandable, sometimes just moving on for those people is what will get them through the day. Um, as for me, I grew up far removed from all the trauma and the situations that, that happened. So I think as, as a descendant of someone with this history, I feel compelled to not only tell this fascinating and I guess heartbreaking and heartwarming story, uh, but, but I also think that telling these stories, telling the history uh, to people who don't know about it uh, really helps, I guess, widen the breadth of historical knowledge for the general populace, as well as just keeping memories alive, memories of people who are often forgotten when we tell history. Um, I'll pass it over to my dad for what he thinks. Yeah, I would just add that um, it's always good to learn from history and it teaches a lot, a lot about human strength and survival and our ability to go through hardship and still thrive. So I, I wouldn't, I, I'm in a camp that, yeah, it's good to share. And that's why I, I'm so happy that Jared's doing this. Because as he said in the beginning, not many people know the story. And if we don't tell it, no one will know. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I'm on the same boat. Thank you so much for answering that. Yeah. Um, oh, one more thing. So uh, real quick before answering more questions. Um, I did, when I did the interviews, I did ask a little bit more about their experiences coming to the United States, but uh, I felt for the purposes of this portion of the documentary, it would be fitting to just focus on how they escaped. Of course, the experiences of immigrants and like what, what they go through are unique as well. So I, I do want to uh, ultimately tell that story. This 30 minute segment is, I guess, the early phases of what hopefully would be a much longer documentary uh, or like a series that could tell the whole story and perhaps even other stories too. Um, go ahead, whoever was talking. Great. Awesome, awesome. Sharon Knox, you have your hand up? Um, yeah. Um, so, so hi, Jared and, and Mr. Hang. I just want to say uh, what a, what a, um, I'm so, I'm so glad that you're putting this documentary together and I hope you will put many more together. So I, I grew up um, in Malaysia and uh, lived in Malaysia during this time. And, and this, it was, you know, this was, it was normal every day to, to read the news about what was happening in Cambodia and Vietnam. And then, um, when the refugees came uh, to to Malaysia and there was a refugee camp, my mom um, uh, began volunteering and sort of arranging for us to go. And you know, I would play with the kids and and hold the babies. And and uh, my mom actually stayed in touch with um, with some of the families that she uh, became close to during those years. But I, I feel like this, you know, this history, like it's just gone. It's like we don't learn about it anywhere. Um, and, and so I think that, um, I guess I'm, I'm curious to ask you and your dad both sort of, you know, why is that? What, what, why is something that, it's like we hear more about World War II and the greatest generation and things. And here are people who remember these things. Um, still alive, remembering them vividly. And, and um, it's part of US history. We were there and part of world history. So, so sort of A, thank you. B, I can't wait to see what you do with, with this. I'd love to see some images and, and music. I hope that's what you have planned. And definitely I'll, I'll yes, for sure. catch up with you through the honors program. But I'd love to hear from you and your dad sort of what's wrong with history that we don't teach this. Uh, I guess I'll start. Okay, my dad. My dad will start. I can start with that. I I think part of it is we were. Uh, if you look at history we, in America, we tend to not want to talk about the Vietnam War, and mainly because of what happened and how America lost or whatever it might be. It seems like 
we tend to stay away from the topic of Vietnam War. Uh, World War II, uh, you know, Korean War, those things were more prominent. Uh, but when it came to Vietnam War and what happened after the Vietnam War, uh, I think America didn't have the appetite for what was going on then. And so I think that has a, uh, a lot to do with it. Uh, but one other thing I'd like to also share with you and, and hopefully ask Jared to connect with you, uh, Sharon, is that um, uh, given that your mom was involved in the Malaysia, um, my wife, Jared's mom, actually escaped through the boat and her family was picked up, uh, boat drifted all the way to Malaysia. And they were picked up by a, um, uh, I, I want to say it was the, uh, some of the missionaries that were there on the island uh, that convinced the government to allow the boats to come ashore so that they can take care of these refugees. And Jared's mom was on one of those boats. And it'd be interesting to see if your mom was there at the same time to share that story that Jared can work on for his next documentary. Yeah, I love that. Let's connect. I, I you know, have photos. And in fact, that um, my mom really was presented helpful. with replica boats as, a, as sort of gifts of gratitude for her involvement. So we actually have these handmade, beautiful boats that were made with, wow. with that wood. So let's, let's, get, let's definitely get in touch. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I believe historians call that group of refugees the Vietnamese boat people, uh, as I mentioned in the... Um, in the documentary. And uh, but one of the things I was sad about is I wasn't able to uh, get footage of my mom telling her story yet. Uh, and with the pandemic and stuff, it just made all this production process a lot more difficult because one man crews are not exactly the most efficient or effective uh, when it comes to recording documentaries. But these, these stories, um, I grew up hearing, and I'm sure many of you have as well, or some of you have as well. Um, they're powerful. And ideally, we'd like to tell all of them. Um, if anyone else has a question, may continue. Um, oh, yeah, uh, sorry, to answer the question of why, why do I think the history is uh, not as not as great? Um, definitely, definitely a lot of Eurocentrism. Um, in, in high school, there's the option of AP world history or AP Euro history. And uh, to put it in perspective, the entirety of Europe is roughly as big, if not smaller, than the contiguous 48 United States. Um, and the fact that we focus so much on such small swaths of the world kind of just leaves, that, leaves a lot of room to leave out a lot of different people. And yes, when it comes to the Vietnam War, when it comes to Southeast Asia, not a lot of white people there. So the the American centric uh, history schools of thoughts uh, just don't cover it. And hopefully with these new waves of historical thinkers and college students who want to go into the fields, hopefully we can teach more than just European or just American history as well and into Asian history. And, and not even with, with China as a dominant force in the area, not just Chinese history, but like the surrounding regions as well and what happened to them. Um, I will take more uh, questions as well. Absolutely. And um, to close us out, uh, Dr. Annalisa Franz. Sorry, no pressure for the last question, but I want to agree. <laughs> First, thank you, uh, Jared and Steve Hang for sharing. Um, and this actually, my question does build on something you mentioned very in the begin very beginning of your documentary and then what you've been discussing about how to share and include this in a lot of the teachings. Because you mentioned, you know, in, in the textbooks, especially when we think about um, in high school and even just earlier in K through 12. So in, in Davis right now, the Davis Joint Unified School District has an ethnic, ta uh, ethnic studies task force that many professors and parents are involved with and forums that have been going on. Maybe some of you have been aware of them. So I wanna think about what advice would you give to those of us participating in these discussions and the task force to think about how we could incorporate more of this into the K through 12 that are coming forward which are really trying to propose cultural competency immersion when we think about 
allowing students at an earlier stage, not just language immersion, but cultural competency to learn about different cultures, different stories, not having whitewashed and Eurocentric type um, presentations. So I'd, I'd love to hear if you have any thoughts that might have come up um, during your discussions. Um, honestly, haven't had nearly enough of those, those discussions. Uh, again, having been a one man, I guess, documentary crew, uh, it, it was a little bit more difficult, especially with fewer resources, um, learning about these things. So it took me a while, I guess, in telling these task forces uh, what, what to teach. The only thing I can think of is tell world history. And when I say world history, I mean world history. And that means everything. And human history, we've only been here, we've only had recorded history for what, 8,000 years? Not a ten, if we're if we're lucky, um, just telling as much history as we can from all portions of the world would be ideal. And oftentimes, when it gets to earlier back, only the dominant forces of the of regions have survived, like the Chinese dynasties or the Roman, excuse me, the Roman Empire. Um, there's a lot of Native American history, uh, North and South, that is that has been lost because of, well, historical reasons. And learning about those histories, and I guess, I think more importantly, you should teach students, or you should tell students or inspire students to learn more themselves, because there is no way that a K through 12 uh, history curricula will cover the entirety of, uh, of US history, or, or no, sorry, sorry, world history. Sorry, I'm an American. US equals the world in my mind. <laughs> All right, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I was, um, sorry, if I can say, I, Jared, I think that's why the, the story that you're sharing is really important. I hope it does then get to connect in with these other efforts. So that was part of my reason for mentioning it, because I think that hopefully there's growing movements and by creating this documentary, you're going to catalyze sure. change in a lot of ways. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. And uh, for those of you who want to, I guess, message me more, I am very poor with messaging on email, but I will try to get to you as much as I can. Um, I can put my email in, um, what is it called, in, in the chat. Uh, please do not hesitate to reach out to me if you want to, I guess, add, pool some knowledge together or if you have any ideas of groups or if you have any other large groups like SAFE um, who want to study this history, please do not hesitate to reach out to me, reach out to each other. Uh, let's, let's teach history to the world. Awesome. I love it, Jared. I thank you, Jared. Thank you, Mr. Hang, again for being here. Um, this was very, very inspirational and I know very personal for you. And so I thank you all for being willing to share your story with us here today and giving us that honor. And Jared, please accept this invitation that as you develop your documentary series, whatever the URC can do to help you get, your, get the word out and promote we are happy to do it. So please stay in touch with us and let us know how your series continues to develop. Um, that's, all we, that's all we have for today. The recording for this uh, document, this event will go onto our Go React site. And we will also be adding many of our recordings from our live events to our video library on our URC website. So please make sure that if you don't get to see it on Go React and you wanna rewatch re this amazing story that you visit our video library at our website, urc.ucdavis.edu. And I do wanna say really quickly, we do have another live event this evening, a faculty and YouTube. Yes, thank you, Lolita. Um, and we uh, have another live event this, this evening with our faculty and student networking event. We will have a panel from 5.10 to 6 p.m. with our HARC, that is HARC specific, to HARC specific for research. And then we will have one immediately following at 6.10 for our STEM folks. And so we hope that you want to join us tonight. We have faculty, graduate students, and undergraduate students who will be joining us to share their experience about research. And thank you so much. Follow us on Instagram at UCD underscore URC or follow us on our website for all the update, up to date information, urc.ucdavis.edu backslash conference. Thank you, thank you to Jared. Thank you, thank you to Mr. Hang. Thank you to everyone for coming here. Have a great rest of your day.